Um, and I see Mateus is online. Good morning, Mateus. So um, I have the pleasure. Hi, good morning. Of, yeah, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Mateus van Oetgen. Um, sorry, from Oetgen. Um, and he is the university librarian at Utrecht um, University in the Netherlands. He has a PhD in philosophy, and he worked for 12 years at the Koninklijke um, Big Bibliothek um, in a variety of different positions. From 2013 until 2022, he was the director of the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and his main interests are in digitization, open scholarship, and how these two trends affect the role of librarians. So I first met um, Matthias uh, online through OCLC. We both are on what was once called Global Council and is now going to be called the Leaders Council or Leadership Council. And um, we have had some wonderful conversations uh, talking about the importance of digitization. And uh, so he has very graciously agreed to join us um, online and to share some of the experiences from his university and um, from the Netherlands around digitization and open scholarship. So um, we are all very cold down this side in South Africa, Matthias. Um, so we hope it's a little bit warmer for you on your side uh, and over to you and we look forward to you sharing the ideas with us and then we will open for a few questions at the end. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Um... And thank you for the invite to join your conference. Um, it's again, we meet online um, because it, it's 13,000 kilometers between Utrecht and Johannesburg. Um, I would love to be in the same room with you to have these discussions, but I'm still very grateful I can join your conference online. Um, and I, I, I really love to discuss open science and AI. Um, I see my presentation is there on the screen. Um, my colleagues will help me to flip through it. Um, and actually, I couldn't think of any smaller title than Open Science and AI, because the, well, these, these things are huge. And we've got 20 minutes, 30 minutes, perhaps. Um, so there's a lots of things to touch on. Um, and I certainly won't claim to be an expert in this field. Actually, I've got also some questions for you. Um, but maybe... It's also a good way to explore these together, to see where we're on the same page and how we can move forward together um, in this broad field of scholarly communication. So could I have my first slide, please? Uh, then I'll point out a few things I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes. Um, as I said, these two, two notions, open science and AI, are huge. So I think it would be helpful first to start with some definitions, some how we grasp these two concepts. Um, and then I'd like to move on to touch on what's new. Um, because I think AI, at least in some form, is already with us for, for a few decades. Um, and it's also within our library community. Uh, but somehow we all feel the game has changed over the past two years. And why is that? Why is that happening? And what's exactly the, the kind of change? And then I'd like to conclude with guessing what's next. Uh, I can't tell the future, but at least we can speculate. And at least we can find a way forward and see some, well, some directions that might be useful for libraries. Um, and that's where the discussion comes in. And well, we'll see where it takes us. So that's what I'd like to do. Um, given that this is an online presentation, um, I'd like to suggest that I do the presentation first, and then we have the questions afterwards. Um, because it's, well, there might be some delay in our connection, so it will be hard to have the back and forth during the presentation. Um, so if that's okay to you, I'd like to kick off and having my next slide, please. So about open science. Um, I'm a true believer. Uh, open science is not only open data or open access. Um, I think it's a movement. It's a way of living. Uh, to make scientific research, data, um, and uh, dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society. So it's not only that we open up the publications from our own institution, or that we register data sets, or code, or software. 
but it's also that we give people access to the process of scholarly communication itself uh, to actually participate in the research to be transparent about it um, to recognize and reward the efforts from anyone involved it can be researchers it can be support staff it can be interested citizens so actually it's a movement um, and the funny thing with movements is it always reminds me of this, this, this nice quote of Art Guthrie. Um, if one people says something, they, they think he's a nutter. If two people say something, well, there might be something in it. And if three people or more start saying something, it's time to get a movement. And that's exactly what's happening with open science. And, and we're used to open access. It has been with us for, for 20 years at least. Like to refer to the Budapest Declaration 2003, but actually it, it has been with us for ages. Um, and now we move on to data, to code, to, go, to software, um, and there are lots of things we could touch on. But what I'm really interested in this talk is how it connects to what's happening in digitization, you know, digital transformation, uh, in which AI plays such an important role. So that's in short, my view on open science. And if we move on to the next slide, I'll put some definitions of AI. Um, and I put two of them on the sheet. Um, and not surprisingly, they're a bit different. Um, and you, you recognize some similar words in them. Um, it's about computing power. It's about intelligence. It's about humans. Um, but what role? they play these humans and in and how they relate to intelligence and this computing power that might differ on your perspective um i took a definition for ibm a long-standing computer firm and here you see um ai is a way of of computing that to simulate or suggest human intelligence and problem solving capacities um so actually here you see already part of what's new in this movement, that we actually try um, to, to simulate or perhaps substitute human intelligence and problem solving. Um, at the same time, you could say, well, it, it, it's just a way of working. Um, it's also about problem solving. Um, but here you see the ISO definition, and ISO is known for its very numerous standards. Um, and it's more focused on the system that generates outputs um, that can, can help you um, to, to, to solve human-defined objectives. And here, human is used in a different way. It's not that it suggests human intelligence. Um, it's, help, it's helpful um, to make decisions by, for human-defined objectives. So you, in, in, in the first definition, uh, there seems to be such a well, kind of competition between the machine and the person in the second definition, actually, it's a supportive role. We can see AI can be very helpful um, and to, to, to support us in our decision making. Um, and oh, yes, I'll add something about the illustration I put in. This is from a French graphic novel. Qui décide notre destiné? Uh, uh, who is going to decide on our future? And actually, that's the key question many of us have in mind when it comes to AI. So there are different perspectives you can have on it. And if we move on to the next slide, um, um, there, I, I put on a few things where I, I try to identify the change that's going on. Um, actually, I think everybody of us, if you work in the library, has had something to do with optical character recognition, something to do with digitization. You have a printed book or a text, you make a scan of it, you want to extract the text so that you can offer it in a machine-readable format. And the technique you use for it is OCR, optical character recognition, and it has been with us for, well, for ages. Um, it's getting better and better. Um, when I was working at the National Library, we had this huge digitization project for newspapers and how to get a, a proper correct OCR text uh, was 20 years ago one of the big challenges. Um, so, um, OCR is actually a way of machine learning. Um, 
it's an algorithm where you try to determine if you have two characters, which one will be the most likely to be the next one. So that you can construct words, you can construct sentences, and in this way you can define what should there be in the text. You can use this, this algorithm to define where uh, uh, an article stops, uh, where it starts, what's the header. Um, that's all things you can teach a machine. Um, and I put on a sheet where I, there are several ways of machine learning. Um, and actually the technique that is used uh, for the, most of these algorithms we were used to um, was what can be called by mathematicians a hidden Markov chain. Actually you're trying to guess what was the next character. And then you make a string of characters, you make the words, you make the sentence, you construct the text. It's a linear model. The huge game changer now is that we uh, move to deep learning, um, which is not linear. Um, and you can, if you if you depict the, 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 the old techniques like one arrow, uh, where you try to guess in what direction it's heading, new techniques in deep learning actually have two arrows. So there's a whole area um, which you try to predict that could be an outcome. Um, and that's a huge game changer because that allows for generative AI. That allows to uh, transpose results from one form to another. Um, that you have a text and you can suggest someone reading it. That you can ask a question and get an answer. And I, I didn't put any examples of these in my presentation because um, I guess you've got lots of these in your conference. And if not, you can play with it anytime you like. Um, actually, what I tried to do with ChatGTP is um, suggest some recipes for the things I have in my fridge. Um, so I have some courgette, I have some chicken. Can you suggest me any, any recipe um, so they can make dinner tonight? And actually, it's quite good at it. And then you start playing with it. Uh, and you say, hey, I, I don't like onions. Um, do you have any substitute? And they say, yeah, you can use garlic. And then I say, well, no, I'm, I'm allergic to garlic. Can you suggest me something else? And actually, the suggestions get stranger and stranger. Um, because actually what the machine is doing is building on the most likely suggestion, suggestion that comes next. Another way of testing it is, is saying, for instance, um, um, uh, I, I'm not a musician, but say, um, how would it sound if I would play guitar like Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones? And then chat GPT come over with all kinds of answers, and they're quite likely. If you would ask next, uh, how would it sound if I would play the trombone like Keith Richards? It gets more difficult. Um, machines right now, they know that Keith Richards is not famous for playing the trombone. Nevertheless, it will offer you lots of suggestions who it might sound. And here you see what the machine is doing. It's calculating the best possible option given the amount of data it has. Um, so actually that's what it's doing. Um, and it's getting better and better at it. And one of the key things what makes it better is that it has to have huge amounts of data. Um, and that's where the library comes in because that's what we're good at. We already have huge amounts of data in our collections. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, I, I looked up a few examples uh, of machine learning in libraries um, beyond the OCR example I already gave. Um, because these two developments, open science um, and uh, AI, are right up on our street. Because, hey, libraries have been sharing information for, for ages. That's what we're good at. That's what we do. We like to share information. That's what we're for. So actually, the open science movement is not very new for us. The way we do it, the way we engage with researchers, that's quite new. Um, but the whole concept and the convictions behind it, they're already there. Um, and then if you look at digitization and AI, there, there's lots of techy stuff in it. Um, and I touched on some of it, but I'm certainly not an expert, so I won't get into it any further. But the whole idea behind it is that you have a huge data set 
um, and that you can manage it, manipulate it, and get, get more out of it. Actually, that's something that appeals to us as librarians. Um, my, or my predecessors would call it collection management. Um, and I, I just picked some two examples of, of libraries experimenting with machine learning. Um, and the first of one is, is, is my old university, Erasmus University of Rotterdam, um, where they have all kinds of research intelligence services. Um, and the basic idea is, as a library, you want to collect the academic output of your own research institution. So you want to collect all the publications, preferably collect the data sets, get the information about rewards, prizes your researchers own, and you can all store them in one database, your institutional repository. And we are already used to it, that we want to share it with the rest of the world, um, preferably via open access. But you can, do with, if you can do more with it. If you have this database, you might also like to add this thesis from your students to it. Um, because those researchers you have, they're most likely to be the supervisors of these students. Um, and then the data set is growing. And then, if you have it, you can add also some other data sets. You can, for instance, count with which universities your researchers are cooperating. And you can add data from these universities. And in this way, you can build up a huge knowledge base. And if a research group wants to know, from, hey, um, at least in my part of the world, the, you want, might want to get some European funding, which are good partners to, to cooperate with? Uh, which trends in my research might be in my research might be successful if I do a grant application? All these kinds of questions you can feed it to, to this knowledge base, and you get answers if you use general if you use machine learning. And actually, then the data starts to work for you, um, and you get all kinds of new services you can offer to your research community as a library. Uh, so. That's a very interesting way of, of developing new services. And, and this is really transformative because there's no way you could offer these services in any other way. Okay, hey, we're used to management reports. Uh, what we used to do is, is extract some data from our institutional repository and say, hey, we've got that many publications from this school, that many from the other. Well, nice to know. But if you can ask questions to the system and get answers back, get trends, um, then it gets really interesting. Um, so that's one way of, of using machine learning in your library um, to make it business intelligence from your own research output. Um, the second example is a, is, a, is a typical one. It's based on generative AI. Uh, I came across it actually on Monday um, and, and much of the information in this presentation is just well, I, I, I found it this week because things are moving so fast. And it's about a library who used AI um, to have a chatbot um, in an exhibition of, about the World War. Um, and well, here you see the pros and cons. We've been working with chatbots in library for ages. They were not really good, but they're getting better and better and better. Uh, up to a point where you can give it a try and use it in this way. Um, and actually, um, if it was talking about the exhibition and World War, it was quite fine. But if you started asking questions about any other topic, it got completely lost. Uh, and and, and well, people thought it really funny or, or painful, depending on the kind of questions you would ask. Um, and here you see the, well, the opportunities and the limits of AI at the same time. Um, Actually, uh, that's, that's something we have to figure out as libraries. What, what do we really want from it? So, two examples uh, of what's already going on, what's already possible. Um, and I especially like the Rotterdam example because it shows what you can do as a library. And it shows how these techniques can open up the way for entirely new services uh, you could offer to your research community, uh, which help you to stay right at the center of your university as a library, also in the digital age. So, um, I've only got five minutes left, so I would like to move on to the next slide um, and, and, and get some perspectives on what might be next. Um, because there are also some, some issues attached to, to AI and especially to the data set you need. Um, 
because it's, it's not something we, we, we'd like to acknowledge, uh, but actually most of the data collected to use these AI systems to train them um, is not collected legally. Um, because it's so new, there are hardly any licenses uh, that stipulate how you can use your data related to AI. Um, and in the library world, uh, ICOG, the International Consortium um, for Library Consortia, issued a statement on AI, uh, focused at publishers, saying, hey, we need a clause about AI purposes in your licenses. Um, we need you to allow you to, to allow our researchers to use your data related to AI, at least in a non-commercial way. Um, and, and many, many institutions all over the world have subscribed to this statement. And I think it's a very symp sympathetic one, because that's what we want. We want to use research output for our research in a non-commercial way, so that they can do their research and, and, and move on and do fundamental research in these kinds of developments. At the same time, if we ask this from publishers, they need to approach their authors to make it happen. And I, I, I noted that Cambridge University, just a few weeks ago, sent out a mailing to all their authors, hey, would you like to sign this addendum to your contract, uh, allowing us um, to include uh, AI clauses in our licensing? Um, because we can ask something from publishers, like I call does, but if they don't have the rights, um, they can't grant it to us. And here you see one publisher, and I, I just picked out Cambridge, and they are the good guys. They're really moving towards open science and open access, so I really trust them. But all publishers uh, all over the world are working on it and are sending these kinds of letters and mailings to their authors uh, to get the rights to allow AI. Um, and in the case of Cambridge, it's a university press. They're the good guys. I'm really convinced that they also want to help our researchers. But there are also some publishers um, who are on a stock exchange uh, and are interested to making more profit out of this new possibility and new rights. Um, so what would we advise our researchers? Um, should we support the ICOG statement, uh, which as a consequence would be that publishers approach our researchers to transfer at least part of their rights to allow it? Or as a library, should we focus on our research community and say, hey, watch out. These guys want you to transfer your rights. Don't do it. Um, it's, it's quite tricky. So who serves whom? Um, who are we serving? Who are we protecting? Um, I'd like to make it possible for my researchers as a reader to use AI. I would like to, to warn them not to transfer their rights as an author. And they're the same person. So what should we do? Um, and at the same time, what can we do ourselves? We could build our, in open, uh, our own um, institutional repository, enhance it, and use it as a knowledge base. Because that's one of the, one of the tricky things, is that we, um, we, we, we don't have our own AI databases. Um, and that's an interesting development. So there, 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 are, very, there are few roads we can, we, we can explore. One is the big one where we have to find a way to support our researchers in these big questions, how to handle AI, intellectual property, um, and, and, and ways of, of allowing machine learning for their research. A second development could be that we say, hey, maybe we should focus on finding ways to shrink a data set, um, to make it possible to use data for AI purposes on a, on a smaller scale. Um, and there are also some examples where they do that. And I put one in my presentation um, in, in, in biomedical sciences, where they use a small data set for PubMed. Um, and actually, if you would test the system, uh, it would pass most exams directly in their field. So that might also be a direction we'd like to, to, to explore. So I touched on a lot of things in these 25 minutes. Um, there, there's far more to say. I would love to join you in the room and, 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 and discuss it for the entire day. But I think I should leave it at that. Um, and I should open the floor for discussions because I think that's the question I'm most curious about. What do you think?
So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Mateus, thank you so much. So I think you've given us an enormous amount to think with and to think about. Um, and for us, definitely in the global south, questions of open science and open access to information all have a lot of different um, layers of importance. Uh, so I'm going to open to the floor and ask if anybody has any questions, um, please raise your hands. So while people are kind of thinking of, yeah, okay, we've got one question. Um, thank you so much for the, that insightful presentation. I would just like to ask about some ethical considerations. I, I think you gave us a lot to think about, as Prof. Maria has said, but I wanted to find out what ethical considerations um, should we take into account when we are using data to analyze uh, research trends and so forth in, in these AI tools. Uh, because often there's an issue around data privacy. So in our, you just spoke about our institutional repositories or our research data repositories. And I, I think we, 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 we kind of have a bit of um, trust or confidence in those because we, we know where the data is, is going and we know that our, or at least we know that our research data is secured within our institutional platforms. So how do we then um, make sure that the data is secured in these AI platforms. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. And um, it's a really tough one. How do you, I, I'll just shortly summarize how I understand it. Your question is how do you um, protect your data and also guarantee the privacy of your users um, when you're exploring all these kinds of techniques? Um, and that's a very difficult one. Um, First of all, I, I'd, I'd like to um, say the obvious that, that um, uh, open science doesn't mean that everything should be open. Um, it's open as possible, but as close as necessary. Um, because there's, there's several interests here at hand, and you're absolutely right about that. Um, and that's where public values come in. Um, I think as, as public institutions, um, we have an important role to play uh, to create a level playing field, um, to make sure that we um, uh, keep the ownership of our own data. So there's digital sovereignty involved, but there's also equity involved. Um, we know our own academic community and we can make sure that everyone in it uh, is represented in, in, in the database we collect and is represented in the correct way. And if we just send out the data, there's no way we can exercise any control over it. And of course, I'm still in favor of open access. Um, and I think everybody, regardless whether you're a commercial party or private party or anyone, uh, should have access to data. Um, yet I think um, the combined sets of publications, uh, data sets, uh, information about your researchers um, should be the exclusive right of your own institution. Then you can manage it, then you can establish ways with your own privacy officers um, uh, had to, to, to guarantee the integrity of the data set and guarantee the privacy of your users. Um, but that, that's hard work. Okay, I, I immediately admit it, there's, there's lots of things to say, it's not an easy way forward. Uh, Mateus, thank you so much for the answer. Um, I'm just going to use my privilege as chair to ask um, a question that I have for you. So we have, in our different universities, all been setting up research data sets. Because for funding reasons, researchers have to put their data sets up uh, onto these um, repositories. Some of them are open, some of them are closed behind some sort of password controlled access. Um, but we don't see a lot of researchers using each other's data. So we have growing data sets, but they don't really get used. Um, what is it like in Europe? Are people using each other's data sets or do you see a similar trend? Yeah, you ask, what about the reuse of data sets? 
Um, and I think we're on the same page. I see the same trend in Europe. Uh, we are collecting and storing and offering more and more data sets, uh, but reuse is, is lagging. Um, and actually, I think that's where libraries can offer some, some services. Because if you look at these data sets, um, well, honestly, the metadata is quite crappy in most cases. Um, so what would be very helpful, I think, if at, at least we got the basics right, and we support our researchers to uh, assign a DOI to every data set, which makes it findable and citable. Uh, second thing is that we help them um, to get the metadata right, not only title, author, that kind of stuff, but also how do you make it? I know you made it. Um, what kind of machinery did you use? Um, and that we start building a data registry. At least that's, that's my ambition in my own university. Um, we've got data sets all over the place in, in Zenodo, on our own systems. Sometimes they're huge and they're in an international uh, discipline based infrastructure. There's, there's no place where we have a complete overview of all our data sets. And if we have these two things, we have the DOI, we have the registry, then we can add the DOI to every publication or institutional repository. And I think that will boost research because then you see, hey, this publication is based on this data set, uh, which invites uh, research, researchers to have a look at these data sets if they like the publications. Um, so that would be our agenda, at least in my university. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's um, very much where our conversation is at at the moment as well. And I think it would be very exciting um, for researchers to start looking at each other's data sets as opposed to always reinventing and redoing all the groundwork. Um, yeah. So any other questions um, from the floor? Online? We're all good. Okay. So, um, Matthias, thank you so much once again for your time. It's been really insightful. We're going to ask if you can send us the um, PowerPoint so that we could send it out because you had some very, very interesting links to different um, either pieces of research or um, products, which I think people will want to go and have a look at. So thank you very much for that. And I'm going to hand over now to you, Brian, I think. Yes.